Today's segment of Sound Balming is brought to you by Jimmy and Mary's Authentic Body Care. I cannot express to you how much we love, love, love their products. Although we use them all year, as the weather gets colder, we need these products even more. The dreaded drop in temperature, the dryness, the itchiness, and the unnecessary flakiness is inevitable. Shea Butter from Jimmy and Mary's Authentic Body Care is the only thing that works for my skin and hair needs. Not only do these products cure my dry skin, the whipped butter goes on smoothly and doesn't leave that uncomfortably thick, sticky residue. Bonus? It smells absolutely amazing. There are so many different scents to choose from too. Not only do they carry skincare products, there are products for authentic living, face, shower, hair and beard, spritzers and perfumes, and bath products. Let me tell you, we cannot even keep the stuff in the studio. The entire production team, as well as all our children, use Jimmy and Mary's product. Jimmy and Mary's take pride in creating quality, handcrafted products from simple ingredients for the entire family. Their products are made for all skin types and are 100% handmade, 100% vegan, and 100% cruelty free. Skin care is important. Moisture is key and keeping our skin and hair hydrated is essential. I cannot emphasize how much we trust Jimmy and Mary's for all of our skin care needs. Hurry on up to jimmyandmarys.com and check out their products. Did I mention service is fast and efficient too? Don't forget to mention that you heard about Jimmy and Mary's authentic skin care on Sound Balmy. Use the discount code soundbalm20 to get 15% off. That's soundbalm20 for 15% off at Jimmy and Mary's Authentic Skin Care. Hey everybody, welcome to Sound Bombing. I created this show for people who want to experience a radical, life-changing journey through the sounds of my diverse guests. I hope that each sound you hear on this show will strengthen your faith, encourage your dreams, and challenge you to awaken the greatness within you. Drop the bomb. Drop the bomb. We're going to drop the bomb. We're going to drop the bomb. We're going to drop the bomb. This is a journey into sound. A journey which along the way will bring to you new color, new dimension, new values. And a new experience. Ladies and gentlemen, the star of the show, Lamar Darnell Shields. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever the time of the day is. You're with me, you're with Dr. Lamar Darnell Shields, and welcome to my show. I am the creator of Sound Bombing, and my goal with this show is to introduce you to people with the ideas that will help you unlock your full potential, like my last guest, Brendan Kumasami, who talked about the power of stories. Let me go back. Welcome to my show. I am Dr. Lamar Darnell Shields, the creator of Sound Bombing. And my goal with this show is to introduce you to people with the ideas that will help you unlock your full potential. Like my last guest, Brendan Kumarasamy, who talked about the power of stories and about how you engage a person when you are speaking on stage. I probably don't have to remind you of the stats about women in high-level leadership positions in the U.S. And if I do, let's put it this way. They are grim. Most of the time, all you have to do is look around the C-suite of your company and the picture will be all too clear. But there are plenty of women who have made it to the top and today they are sharing their secrets for success. One of them is joining me today in the bomb shelter, Eliza Van Court, an in-demand consultant, speaker, writer, and communications, career, and workplace issues of women's empowerment. 
the founder of the Actors Workshop of Ithaca. She is also a Cook House Fellow at Cornell University, an advisory board member of the Performing Arts for Social Change, a diversity crew partner, and a member of Govern for America's League of Innovators. Her first book, A Woman's Guide to Claiming Space, will be published in May of 2021. But she is here with me today to share her story. And I'm so excited that you decide to hang out with me today, Eliza. How are you doing? And let my listeners know where you are calling in from. Well, thank you so much for having me. I am so excited to be here. I am in chilly, chilly central New York. We are experiencing a semi-blizzard right now, but I am warm and I'm very thankful for that. Now, when you said you were in Chile, I'm like, she's in Chile, she's in South America, <laughs> and she's cold. I mean, come on. But I am on the East Coast like you, so we got hit with the same storm uh, that you all got hit with. But I don't think ours was as bad. Actually, now the rain is coming in and some of the ice. So I just took my dog out. I got a brand new dog. Uh, his Aww. name is Beepo. He's a cockapoo. And this dude is all over the place. And he, I'm outside with him like, dude, would you just go to the bathroom? Would you just stop trying to <laughs> lick the ice? Would you just do what you have to do? Uh, but so we're in the same, we're in the same environment where the snow uh, has come. And I love this. I, I'm, I love the snow for one or two days. I grew up in Chicago. I love the serenity of the snow and it slows people down. But I hate the cold. And you up there, are you, are you in Ithaca? I am in Ithaca. It's funny because before the pandemic, people would ask me where I lived and I'd say, oh, I live in Ithaca, but I don't really feel like I'm here because I travel so much for my work and I speak everywhere. And now people ask me where I live and I'm like, I'm in Ithaca. <laughs> I'm like right here. Yeah. Many of us uh, like you and me, we have slowed. Well, I'm not going to say we've slowed down. Thank goodness for social media. Thank goodness for Zoom and Google meetups and all those other platforms that are out there. So let's get down to it. This is the year of the woman, Eliza. Are you ready for this? You it already knew. It. <laughs> We're waiting for it. <laughs> you said you are. You got a woman in the White House. You have yes. a woman who, and, and you know, in politics, you see women all over the place. You send women on magazines. You send women leading stuff. You're just seeing women do that. Then you got the Me Too movement. You have women doing that. We know March is going to be national, you know, as National Women's Month. So you got a, you are a busy, busy bee over there. I'm sure you've been working <laughs> like crazy, even though you can't get on the planes like me. Why are you in so demand? Talk to me about that because I, when I'm reading stuff, it's like I'm in so demand. Is is it because what I just said, or is it really? Is this really truly the the year of the woman? Um, I think it's twofold. I mean, I think one of the things actually is that women are getting really hit hard by the pandemic. Mm. Um, and it is disproportionately hitting women of color. And uh, women are leaving the workforce if they're in a privileged position in droves. If they're not, they're losing their jobs and they're unemployed. And so there is just a lot happening. And we're trying to find strategies to claim space, to, to get our power and to be able to ride this really unfortunate wave of this pandemic. And so I think they're really looking for people with resources. Um, and I think the reason why people talk with me, I think is twofold. Some of it's that I have a really weird background. <laughs> um, so I was a political science major in undergrad. Hey, um, hey yeah. studying dead white man, right? Is that what we did all yeah, the time? Yeah, we <laughs> Actually, I was, I did some, back in the day, Boulder was a little bit ahead of the time. And I studied with Manning Maribel. I took African American studies with him. I did. Wow. Yeah. So I had, um, I kind of had a focus on isms, although they didn't call it isms back in the day. Mm -hmm. It was like, you know, women's studies and African American studies. Yeah. But, you know, I, I did that. Um, and then I went to law school for a year um, and I got a scholarship to do whatever I wanted after my first year. And I was like, oh my God, I could do any of this and I don't want to do any of it. So I turned down all my offers and I did a two year acting program. And so my approach to this work, most people are either like, OK, we're going to do the you know, communication and we're going to talk about the scholarship behind that. And then some people are actors and they do the physicality and voice. Some people talk about politics and how does that intersect with communication? And for me, I feel like you can't do it right unless you do all three. Yeah. Um, so I do inter the intersection of it physicality and voice with isms. So how do the isms we face and the isms we navigate intersect with 
how we are received and how we treat other people. This is so interesting. We had the same path. I went to school, a political science and Spanish major, wanted to go to law school. I opened up a Yellow Pages dating myself. Saw how many lawyers were in the Yellow Pages. <laughs> um, but then I had this di- desire and love for um, teaching. I had this and d- desire. I'm an artist like you. I'm a, I'm a spoken word poet. Every piece that I put on is a piece of work from putting together a presentation to uh, putting together a PowerPoint, a slide deck, a talk. So I incorporate all of those things into everything that I do. Uh, so we are definitely uh, we are we are walking down the same street. But I want to go back a little bit because I want people to really understand um, some of the struggles that women are faced with right now with this pandemic. Uh, mm-hmm. All the things that are going on, I don't think I don't think people understand how it's affecting women at a greater and an alarming rate than other people, of, of course, in corporate America. So can you can you talk to me about that? Right. Well, it's twofold. I mean, I think, first of all, we have the first fired, uh, first hired, first fired thing. Right. So because certain demographics are the last to get into the positions of power, the last to get into certain industries, who's going first if they're laying off people, that group. And it tends to be women um, and it tends to be women of color uh, more than white women, but women of all um, races and backgrounds are being impacted. And then the other thing about that is that we we are having an experience where a lot of kids are being schooled from home. And so because of the traditional breakdown of gender roles, women tend to just be the fallback. So they are homeschooling their kids while they're doing remote learning. Cause you can't just, you know, you can't just be like, Hey, here's the remote learning piece to your seven year old. Like that's <laughs> Matt as a mother, I can tell you that doesn't work. That could never work for at least for my kids. Um, and so the women are trying to do their jobs at the exact t- same time that they are watching their kids. And so what's happening is women who in higher positions, who, who, especially if they have a partner who has money are just leaving. And they are leaving in record numbers from the workplace, which means we're losing the marketplace of ideas, you know? And so for those two reasons, it's really, really disproportionately hitting women. And then the third reason is that a lot of women left the workplace um, in terms of big corporations and started their own businesses because they just didn't want to deal with the sexism anymore. And that, and small businesses are getting hit really hard now. So all of these different things that, you know, were specific to women and we were doing okay, the pandemic just, you know, exacerbated every social issue possible. And it's really hitting women hard. Well, I know you work with corporate women. I know you work with women who are, who are very powerful in their position. Um, What are some of the lessons that you're learning from some of the female leaders that you're engaging with? And then what are some of their main challenges? Because again, you talked about leaving the workforce, having to stay at home, having to create their own companies. But again, we do see this gender gap between partners, male and female, typically, when it mm-hmm. comes to not only just pay, but what are some of the challenges you're seeing with some of the female leaders and what are some of the lessons that you're learning from them during right. during a pandemic? And so maybe some right. strategies that you can share with my listeners. Right, right. Well, I think the two biggest ones, which is kind of interesting because you'd think if a woman's in power, this wouldn't be a problem, but it is, is remote communication is proving very challenging for women because all of the communication issues that are normally there, again, are just blown up. And so, for example, if you're in a big meeting, the probability of someone noticing if you're not speaking on Zoom is a lot less. The probability of being interrupted is a lot more. The potential for an ally to step in and help you if you're being mansplained goes down because all these dynamics are just a little bit different than what we're used to. So people don't really have the tools to deal with that. So that's one thing. And I give women a lot of strategies for that. And then the other thing is this thing at home, which women are dealing with. And the way that I usually talk with them about that is often, I think if you're in a targeted group, you have been so socialized to accept the unfairness that you don't always see it to the depths to which it actually is happening to you. So I always tell people to flip the script, which means like, let's say you're doing 70% of the housework and you're married to a man And what you have to do is sit down and go, huh, okay, if I were doing 30%, would I feel that was fair to him? And if he said, hey, let's change this, would I be open to it? And if the answer is not fair and I'd be open to it, then I need to actually expect the same from my partner. 
And that can really help. And I actually tell women to do that all the time. I mean, I, I can share with you actually a pretty funny story about that from my own personal. No, go ahead, because I have one. I, I'm thinking of a story that goes in line with that, but I want to hear your personal story. Go okay. Ahead. So, so when I first started this work very, very early on, I got an offer to do a seminar and they're like, so how much do you charge? And I was like, I have absolutely no idea. So I had this man and this is pertinent to the story. He was a black guy who was my mentor. And I called him up and I was like, listen, I don't know what to do because I have this seminar and I don't know what to charge in the seminar. And I start to explain to him what the seminar is and he interrupts me, but this was fair because he had every reason to interrupt me. And he's like, don't worry, I already know what you're going to charge. And I'm like, how do you possibly know what I'm going to charge? I haven't told you yet what I'm doing. And he's like, no, 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 just wait, just wait, just wait. So whenever I don't know what to charge, this is what I do. I sit down. I want you to do this. I sit down, I close my eyes and I think to myself, what would I charge if I were a white man? And that's what I charge. It's usually like three times more than I was going to charge originally. You totally have to do it. And I did. And it was like, oh, my God, I can charge double this. So, you know, basically, it's this idea of valuing ourselves more and holding, letting ourselves put as much value on our own experience and expertise and lives as we do on the power structures. You know, it's interesting, you know, um, and I love I love that story. While you were talking, I was thinking about a story that a friend of mine who is a school leader, I won't say his name because I want to protect the guilty and the innocent. <laughs> and so he was, I do a lot of work around equity, inclusion, diversity, and accessibility. And he was sharing a story where he was on his way to Philadelphia. Um, that's where he's from or his wife is from. And he was getting dressed and he was like, oh, I'm getting, you know, I'm getting everybody this, that, that I'm doing, doing this. He's telling his wife and he's like, yeah, I wash the dishes for you so we can just leave early. Now, it was interesting. I, w- I looked at your face right there. He said, <laughs> I watched it. Now, it's interesting. The women in the room knew his wife and his wife is a lawyer. And they were like, hmm, where is this going to go? So she leaned in and said, what did you say? So, yeah, so we can get out of here really, really quickly. I washed the dishes for you. And he said, are you talking about the dishes that you just ate on? Are you talking about the dishes that our children just ate on? And he said that ride to Philadelphia typically is about an hour and 15 minutes. He said it took about 15 hours to get to Philadelphia. At least it felt like. <laughs> Do you see that a lot in the, because again, I know we are different animals, different creatures, but yeah. in certain spaces, some men don't, they don't think what he said was wrong, but in the space that I'm in, I, you know, you talk about people with 2020, uh, 2020 vision. I want to focus on 2020 listening Do you come across Mm. those conversations a lot as a woman in those space that is somewhat dominant by males who don't think what my friend said was something wrong? And if so, how do you combat that for the male that's listening right now, Eliza, who was a leader or who's sleeping on the couch or who may be at a (laughs) hotel right now? Can you help some of these men out and not even just men being facetious? But some of their partners as well, because it could be also it could be female to female as well. Yes, that's true. I mean, I actually write about the whole fighting for your spot on the bottom phenomena. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that the most important thing, and you actually hit on it, is listening, but also believing. And I think those are the to me, that's the key to everything. I actually do a lot of DEI work as well. Um, my big talks are women claiming space and communication. And then also I was commissioned several years ago to do a talk on anti-racist communication by MIT's Office of Minority Education. So I think we intersect actually a whole lot. Um, And that's sort of directly addressing whiteness. Um, And so one of the things that I find is that there's this phenomenon that happens that when something goes amiss, somebody says, hey, I didn't like that person A. And person B goes, Um, wow, you're overreacting and kind of crazy. (laughs) And person A goes, I'm really sorry. And person B goes, that's okay, I forgive you. And then person A leaves feeling kind of bananas and person B feels completely vindicated and doesn't feel like they need to self-reflect at all. And so the way to interrupt that, of course, is to say, you know, hey, I didn't like that. And the person says, why? I'd like to know why. And then when person A says, this is why, person B says, okay, I believe you. What can I do differently? And I think if we just had that little tiny adjustment of understanding that there are things about my experience that you will never understand. There are things about your experience that I will never understand. And the only way that we're going to have any kind of relationship is if I believe you when you tell me, you know, you might not experience this, but it is real for me. 
And so to me, that is the number one thing that people have to start doing more than anything else. And I, and I call it, you know, calling people in instead of calling them out. There's sometimes, mm-hmm. Eliza, you know, you need to call some people out. Yes. But sometimes you need to call them in because they really don't understand. But I tell people all the time, it is, it's, it's not about the intent, it's the impact. Because you may say, oh, I didn't mean it, but it's the impact that happens a lot. And I know being, having two sisters, having a mother, I have to be very, very mindful of what I say. And now having my own daughters and my own son Mm -hmm. as well, because he is watching how I engage his mother. He's watching how I engage his sisters. And they are also watching how I engage him and treat him as a young man and vice versa. And so I think that we have to be very, very mindful of the, of the things that are taking place in our space. But, you know, let's call some people in instead of calling them out. Speaking, speaking about calling people in, how, how, how did you reach your level of success given the sector's gender, gender gap, especially among leadership? Because again, as we talk about rising amongst the race, ranks, it's so interesting how I still people, I still see people post of like the first African-American this, or the first African-American that, or the yeah. first one. Like, when are we going to stop with the first <laughs> Of everything, you know what I mean? Like with the first African American, the first, the first person with five legs, the first person, like the first. So, as a woman who's constantly rising and rising and rising, uh, how do you deal with that that whole issue of level of success given the sectors, given this gender gap situation amongst leadership? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a little different for me because my main focus is women, right? So just as, you know, if I'm doing DEI work, I'm not going to go into a group of black people and explain to them race, right? That'd be insane. Um, It's funny because my partner is, my my partner Marina is white, white female out of California. She always says, when I'm in a space full of people of color, I listen more. She said, when I'm a space full of people that look like me, I talk more. And she said she had to, she really had to learn that. Because believe me, I know that struggle between black and white women in the space I, just like black and white men in the space. So I, I respect you saying that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, you know, I will talk to white people about whiteness, but I'm, <laughs> I don't need to educate black people about race. So, so it's a similar thing that like, I don't need a man to tell me about sexism. Right. I'm pretty much sure I know better than he does what this is like. So, you know, I, I, because I'm talking to women, I think that obviously I'm not going to deal with the competition of, you know, they're hiring a man over me. I, I do think, however, that there is a, an assumption sometimes that, for example, when I do global communication, I have to make an argument for my work in ways that a white man would not have to do that. And especially because my work is really intersectional. And so people often say, oh, well, isn't that DEI? And I'm like, no, there are women of every background. There are women of every, you know, orientation of every race, of every everything. So like, why would I just focus on one group or why? And why would I focus on one person? So, you know, I often do it for men and women. So I do deal with that. But I think the thing that um, the, honestly, and, and I think this is actually really important because I think a lot of people sidestep this and like to give this whole bootstraps um narrative that I think is not true. Uh, I started out, you know, as an acting teacher in Ithaca, New York, where Cornell University is. Many of the people I work with are connected to Cornell. My first jobs were former students. So, you know, I had a level of privilege and connection that allowed me to get in the door. And I think one of the things that we really want to work on as a society is understanding that we are losing a huge chunk of the workforce to people who don't have connections, but they're brilliantly talented. And so, you know, I definitely don't have the level of connection of a lot of people. I mean, I'm not, you know, Donald Trump's son. I can't call up and be like, hey, I want a book. And they're like, cool, you know, like that's not me. But I definitely can call professors and say, hey, I'm doing this new work. You've worked with me privately. You know, could you connect? Is there any kind of work that you need done at Cornell? And that and that's a real benefit. So I think that is somehow how I have sidestepped some of the sexism is really by, you know, making, forging those connections, which is another reason why I always tell people, you know, you know, network with people you care about and you like, because it will come back to you. Well, speaking of books, talk to me about your book. I love, love, love the title, A Woman's Guide to Claiming Space. Um, Talk to me about the book. And then what are some strategies that can help women claim their space? Because, you know, we, Space is shrinking since COVID. You know that, right? Mm-hmm. Like the dining room is now uh, <laughs> the dining room is now the university. The, the bedroom is now the eighth grade classroom. 
Uh, the living room is now <laughs> the first grade portal. Uh, how do you help, you know, talk to me about the book and then what are some of the strategies to help women claim their space? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I want to say that, first of all, the title is you know, Women's Guide to Claiming Space, but the subtitle I also really like, which is Stand Tall, Raise Your Voice, Be Heard. Mm-hmm. And I really, I really like that. Um, so, and that was a community project. I send out a bunch of potential titles with claiming space in them and the community helped me figure that one out. So it's pretty cool. Um, I, I want to actually say how I got to the book itself, which is kind of a strange route. I, you know, I had some trauma in my earlier life. My mother was paranoid schizophrenic, some really not cool stuff happened. So I was really kind of making myself invisible to the world. And then in 2014, I'd sort of gotten my stuff together. I was riding my bike and someone hit me with their car. And I got thrown on the hood of their car, got knocked unconscious, got thrown into an intersection, had a bilateral sub, a brain injury, subdural hematoma, woke up. When I would wake up in the morning, I'd have, I, I, when I'd go to bed at night, I'd have my whole day in my head. I'd wake up, half my day would be gone. And eventually someone came over to my house and I said, you know, I feel like I'm getting my memory back. Things aren't that weird. It's the only weird thing is that, you know, I liked raw tomatoes and I used to hate them, but I think I'm fine other than that, you know? And my friend said, Eliza, and I said, but the weird thing is everybody's acting really strangely. And she said, Eliza, people aren't acting strangely. You're acting strangely. Your communication is severely compromised and people don't know what to do. And that's what you're picking up on. And I had no idea. So I had to build my communication back brick by brick by brick. And that experience made me have to attend to communication in ways I just hadn't before. And that was really the birth of my business uh, beyond the acting and my book. Um, And what I did is eventually, you know, I was reading journal articles, I was watching people and I started just watching women. And what was it about one woman that allowed her to, for example, sit in a coffee shop and read a book and no one harasses her and she's just chilling and another woman's there and five dudes come up to her and she can't seem to get them to leave. And they look the same, they're in the same demographic. What is it energetically, what is different? And eventually, and then what is it that makes some women really powerful and they're going out there and killing it and others who seem like they have the same level of intelligence or whatever. And so what I found was there are five factors that sort of do that. And if you want, I can, I can blow through them for you. Let's go interested. through them, yes. <laughs> okay, so the first one was their expert communicators. Um, they claim space with their body. The second one is they connect. So they, they share their space, you know, they, they are connective with other women and those women will, they not, they don't just know who they want to bring into their space, but they're very careful about who they don't let in their space. They're anti-mentors. They do not let anti-mentors into their space. And so that was the second one. The third one, I'm an, I'm a nerd. I'm a total sci-fi and like superhero nerd. So, <laughs> but um, emotional kryptonite. Right? So what is it that we do to ourselves? How do we sabotage our own space? So imposter syndrome, toxic relationships, or even internalizing things that would silence us, like words that silence women. Um, And then the fourth one was shutting down aggressions, people who would come into our space and violate it. So that's microaggressions, from microaggressions to sexual harassment. And then the final one is intersectionality which is including everybody in the space. So women who were able to include people who didn't look like them, who didn't have their background, who wasn't their age or their race or anything like that, those women who made a commitment to making the space not inclusive, like, hey, welcome to my space, but this is our space and we're all in this together, were the ones that just rose higher. And as I say in the book, when we rise together, we rise so much higher. So those were like the feel, the five things. So Eliza, who did you write this book for? Is this, is this a letter, an ode to yourself, uh, <laughs> an ode to your younger self? Uh, is, or is it just for the women that you observe uh, in your space when you were doing Eliza stuff, when you were acting, when you were writing? So who was who who this book for? Um, you know, I, I actually do feel like it's it's for every woman. Um, I we have done some testing. <laughs> we have found that um, certain demographics don't love it, um, but that they tend to be very, very radically right, right wing. Um, don't particularly love it. Um, but most what is it that people, they don't love? What is it that they? We don't, don't know, but we found that white women over seventy <laughs> uh, and Trump we don't supporters, love it, but we're not going to tell you. <laughs> yeah, no, I think it's it's white women over seventy and. Um, and uh, Trump supporters are not big fans. Um, and, and all I can say is that I think that unlike many 
I really tried to veer away from white feminism, like this whole idea that, you know, we're going to go through this one lens to explain everyone's experience. And I think there's a real feeling that we are often so centralized that people don't really know what to do when we're just part of the story, and not the whole story. <laughs> so I think that might have been part of it. But I mean, in terms of who I wrote it for, I actually almost called the book Conversations in the Bathroom. <laughs> I know that sounds weird, but after my talks and you workshops, all do have some conversations and we have like, I, my, my son is like, he's like, Baba, why, why is there a line to get into women's restaurant? I said, well, they do something different. And I'm not talking about the biological part. They talk. I had to yes. tell my son when he was from the age of one to maybe seven, there's no conversation in the bathroom. You're not even pulling your pants to your knees anymore. You are not doing that. What, I don't care if we're having a deep conversation when we cross that threshold, that thing stops and then we come back. So I could I just I just visualize your cover, your artwork on that book of some woman, you and some other woman, maybe putting on makeup in the bathroom, yes. looking at each other and having those yes. conversations, because I can only imagine <laughs> Funny story. Let me tell you this. It's about to blow oh, you please, out. Please, too much information. Conversations so too much story. information. So I am, this is, this is pre COVID Eliza. Okay. So I'm flying. I'm on a plane at least twice a month. Shout out to Southwest yeah, yeah. Airlines. I love you all. And so I had to go to the bathroom so bad, Eliza. So I go into the bathroom, <laughs> the bathroom, no doors. So I go into the bathroom, Eliza, and I go into the women's restroom, real story, the yeah, women's yeah. restroom. So I'm in there and I look around, I'm like, why is there some other stuff in the stall with me? I'm like, yo, you know how you start to talk to yourself? Like, yo, this is the women's <laughs> rest. So two women come in and I oh, look no. under like, what am I what going, am I how in the hell am I going to get out of this bathroom? You know, how am I going to, so they're talking, one is TSA, the other one, and they're like, girl, and other, they just, I'm sitting there talking to myself like, what am I going to say? So I'm like, all right, they're not using the bathroom. They're in here in the mirror. They're just talking. I'm like, this is the women's bathroom. So <laughs> I, I put on my, my backpack and I just I just haul ass out of there to get out of there so quickly so no one could see me. And I was like, man, this was crazy. That I get. So every time I tell you, this is the first time I've told this story publicly when you talked about being in a women's restaurant. But again, you all have different conversations than oh, we yeah. have. And they oh, were having yeah. a deep conversation. I'm like, girls, please get out of here so I can get the heck up out out of here right now. And I think that would have been a great title that you had. Oh no, we almost did that because I'd go to the, I'd do my talks, I'd go to the bathroom and then these women, I'd be washing my hands every time I was like, oh, here it comes. This other woman would sidle up next to me, start washing her hands. And then she'd, every time she'd be like, I have a question I didn't want to ask in Q&A. And I'd be like, oh, here we go. And then the next thing, I actually have a record. I think it was two hours once that I was in the bathroom, basically did another seminar after the seminar. And, you know, it's always like this woman's like, you know, John went up there and said that he's the only man in the department and he gets talked over, but we cannot literally shut him up. And we don't understand. <laughs> like, and so they're telling me all these things. And I thought, you know, what if I take these conversations in the bathroom and take them into the sunlight? You know, what if I scale them? These things we don't want to say. And so that was, that was, it's funny because I, I started doing that in Uber. I started doing that. I was at the airport so much and I was having these conversations. I'm like, can I legally record these people? So yeah. I recorded some conversations in Uber, but I never posted those because I'm, I'm so afraid that my, I'm like, listen, I cannot lose a license. I can't <laughs> lose anything. I said, I'll keep them to myself and I'll just sort of recommend them. So I can only imagine you getting stopped in the bathroom. And it's so awkward during the bathroom. You're like, what did I wash my hands? I use the bathroom. Did I smell? But like all those things come to your mind. But I, I, I know that you are an actress. And so I can see the stuff behind you. Uh, mm -hmm. And I want you to talk about what's behind you. But how, what is the intersection with your acting and your your engagement with women who are in positions of power, women who are career minded people? How do you intersect? And I know you talk about Crenshaw's work, the intersectionality. But yeah, what's yeah. your intersection with your acting and as well as your work with women? How do they show up? Yeah, can we like and talk to us about what's in the down background? To that woman. Um, <laughs> so, so well, you know, physicality as an acting teacher, because that's a fifth of my book. Um, I see all the time what what we call physical and vocal adjustments can do to change an entire person. 
So, and it, and it changes how you feel on the inside and how you're treated. So it's this cyclical thing where right? it can be a bad cycle or a good cycle. So, you know, um, I don't know, are they, they going to ever see me or is this all recorded? This is all this video. And that's why I said, if you could talk about what's in the background, like, the, okay, I will explain that. Okay. Mm-hmm. So like I can do something where I wiggle my finger, right. And I wiggle my finger and it doesn't do anything to me. And so that's a dumb adjustment. But if I'm an actor, I can also wiggle my finger. And if suddenly I'm trying to get to a character, it's like, hi, oh, you're my friend, you know, and suddenly I have this whole different thing, right? Then that's going to change everything. So there are things where you can just do a little tiny adjustment. So if I hunch over, it just makes me feel different. So what I do is I work with women on how to expand their body language in a way where they're really claiming their space and also their voice. Because there are vocal patterns that we do. For example, women don't utilize silence because we get interrupted a lot. Women have faster cadences because we have to squeeze more information into the same amount of socially acceptable amount of time to talk. We have to squeeze in more evidence to be heard. I mean, there are all of these things we do that are good for the moment, but counterproductive in terms of how people receive us. And so that's one of the things I work with. And often people come in and I do a posture adjustment and a couple things vocally and they're done. Like, it's just, that's all they needed. So, yeah. And behind me, I can tell you about that too, if you're in. Oh, interested. go ahead. Tell us what's behind you. Oh, so, I, I was yeah. trying not to, you know, I'm such a, like when we're in these Zoom meetings, my partner always says, you're always in somebody's space. Well, they should have right. a green screen or something because right. I look past the person. But what are some things that we're looking at for those that can see? Yeah, absolutely. So um, behind me, so I do all my work in the green room of my studio, which is actually attached to my house, um, which is really convenient because it's close to Cornell and that's where I started my business. So um, the green room, it has uh, the doors. There's actually two doors in here. One you're not seeing. When people graduate from our program, they sign the door. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, my Angela always says she never walks into a room alone because everybody she loves is standing with her. Yes, uh, yes. You know, uh, yes. And I just, uh, so whenever I do these, you know, I'm still a little nervous. Like I'm on the air, I'm doing things. I hope I don't say something ridiculous that I regret, you know? And I feel like all these people I love are right behind me. And, you know, I can just read you maybe one of them. Go ahead. Uh, so here's one that says, now have the courage to be honest. You deserve nothing less. The character, there's no character more interesting than you as a person. Fortune favors the bold. Do not hold back ever. Mm. pretty cool so beautiful. lots of things like that or you have to jump first and grow wings on the way i mean just really beautiful things people how, how important is space how important is space for you as a creator and then how do you prepare the space as you are creating whatever you're creating be it being a piece of for acting or a presentation for a team that's hired you how important is your space and what are some things that are must have in your spaces in order for you to show up as your best self. Right, right. Well, in terms of creating things, I'm going to be honest, I, I don't have the luxury of being like, I just need them to make a space because I have children. <laughs> so if I can have 20 minutes of uninterrupted space, I'm a winner. <laughs> so I've learned to do a lot of stuff under duress. They're older now, but of course now they're all home except one of them. So, you know, um, so <laughs> it would be nice. Um, but in terms of the space, when I'm doing something like this, or if I am um, doing a Zoom presentation, I have really hardcore ADD and it got worse after my accident. I mean, my, I'm like Ms. Distractible. So for me, it's really important that I don't hear a lot of exterior sound when I'm performing because I will just be like, huh? like squirrel, what? You know? <laughs> So that is important. That's why I, before we got on the air, I told my kids, like, don't walk in the kitchen. You might not hear them walking over my head, but all I'm going to think is like, oh, someone's upstairs, you know. Wow. Well, I appreciate you, Eliza, hanging out with me. Uh, but before we get out of here, how can my listeners get in contact with you if they want to pick up a copy of the book and if they want to work with you? And then um, I also want to know, uh, what are your final thoughts for women in 2021? You know, what are some words that you have for them? Yeah, yeah. Well, in in terms of getting hold of me, um, definitely if you subscribe to my website, I don't bombard people. I send a a weekly thing, a a biweekly newsletter, and it's usually something that has value, like like an interesting, like something like this or an article I found interesting or, you know, that kind of thing. Um, And then you can also buy my book now on Amazon. 
just Google Eliza Van Court, no you in court, everybody puts a you, there's no you, um, Eliza Van Court uh, at, in, and Amazon. Um, and I, you know, this is the kind of book that was hard to get a publisher for because I had to convince them that a book that really addresses all women is also going to sell. <laughs> and so um, the more pre-sales I get, the more likely uh, bookstores will. So why do you it. think, why do you think they were hesitant um, to carry your book? I think that there are a lot of books that really just are white feminism. Um, and we can have a whole conversation about that. I mean, to me, that is white supremacy. Because if we're only working on helping one person, that's what that is. Um, but we're very used to, white women are very used to that. And they're not used to a book that is for them, but also includes other people. And so my book, for example, ends on my mentees who I love. They're young women of color. And I hand the book over to them and let them say a bunch of stuff for the last four pages. And I don't say a word. I give the space to them. So I think people just aren't necessarily used to that. Um, they do have books that are, you know, feminist or womanist books for black women, but they, they don't expect white women to engage with that unless they're certain, you know, academic or whatever. And to me, you know, I think we need the Kimberly Crenshaws. We, you know, we need Angela, obviously those giants we need, but we don't need another 800th book on like self-esteem for white women. Like I don't, you know, from my perspective. Mm -hmm. no. So I really just wanted a book that included everybody. And it was, hard. I mean, it was interesting because before, um, before George Floyd, people were like, this is a little radical at the end. And then afterward, they were like, actually, this seems to be with the zeitgeist. So that was sort of an interesting uh, shift. And I was, you know, obviously, that tragedy was, I can't even, yeah, I, I'm, yeah. I'm going to get, I don't want to talk horrible. But, yeah. but what it did do was wake some people up who had been really asleep about the horror that had been happening historically to black and brown people. And that is the one positive that came out of the horror, the absolute horror of that. So, and I think it allowed for people to start being more inclusive in ways that maybe they hadn't been before, but it's still an uphill battle. So, you know, uh, I'm always saying, do the pre-sale thing. Let's get this book in stores. People will actually, you know, um, buy it and uh, understand that it will sell. Um, and then the other thing is, if you have questions about anything, I really love interacting with people. I, I just love it. And um, if you connect with me on LinkedIn and you ask me a question, or even if you're just on Facebook and you want to connect with me on my personal page, I forge the most beautiful relationships with the most unlikely people who just ask me wonderful questions or say, hey, I thought what you said was really dumb and this is why. And I go, oh, okay, well, tell me why, you know, <laughs> let's talk about it. So um, feel free to reach out to me with any questions and I might not get back to you right away, but I promise I will always get back to you. So what impact do you want to leave in the world? Oh, well, I mean, let's, I would like to leave the world a teeny bit better than I found it. If I do that, I, it will be a win. Um, and you asked me what advice I want to leave with people with, and I guess this is what I would say. Um, fundamentally, the most powerful way that we can take first steps to believing that women can play to, to women claiming space is for women to believe, truly believe that we have the right to claim space. That is the first step. We're 50% of the population. We should be able to claim 50% of the space. And once you believe that in your heart, then it's just about learning strategies to do it. Well said. Well, I appreciate you hanging out with me. That's the first part of the show. The second part is called the Super Bomb Questions. And this is brought to you by Mountain Maid. And I ask you a very variety of different questions and very different questions. But this time, Eliza, you have to answer them as quickly as possible. Are you ready? Uh, oh, man. <laughs> I, I, you know, I'm for both. This is going to be hard. Okay, I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you. All right, <laughs> let's go. What's your favorite word? Oleaginous. What's your favorite quote, Bible verse, scripture, or maybe lyric to a song? I, my Angelou, I did what I could do until I knew better. Then when I knew better, I did better. What's your superpower? Seeing other people's superpowers. What's your spirit animal? Probably, I don't know, a snake maybe. I love <laughs> snakes or spiders. I love spiders. Mm. What moved you to tears of joy? Oh, seeing Kamala Harris take the oath of office. What moves you to tears of sorrow? Seeing people hateful toward each other. What values do you live by every day? I try to treat other people as I hope to be treated. What do you wish you had more time to do? 
have fun when I'm promoting my book. <laughs> and I love this, but I want some time to just have a cookie. <laughs> <laughs> What's a ritual you do to help you connect to your inner power? Uh, I listen to music. What's the book or books you've given most as a gift and why? Hope for the flowers, because it's a way of how to get to the top without stepping on other people. If you were in the Mrs. America talent competition, <laughs> Eliza Van Court, what would your talent be? <laughs> oh, God, I would never do that competition. <laughs> I guess it would be singing. I, I sung for seven years. So, yeah. Uh, well, I thank you, Eliza Van Court, for hanging out with me today. Ladies and gentlemen, damas y caballeros, you need to go pick up her book, A Woman's Guide to Claiming Space. It is coming out in 2021. But as she said, you can go and pick up the book right now. It has been a pleasure hanging out with you. I learned so much. I feel your energy. I love the energy that you brought to, to the show. And I appreciate you for hanging out with me. And I wish you but nothing but success, Eliza. So thank you. Thank you. This was such a blast and such an honor. And thank you so much for having me in your space. Well, and I also want to thank, could not do it without my engineer, Alexander Blanc, and my super duper producer. She's so much better now. She is better. She was out sick for a long time. Who am I talking about? My partner, Nicole Klimpaka, Supremacy for our theme music, and all of you for listening. Listen, if you want to know more about me, go to drlds.com drdrlds.com if you want to pick up our merchandise. But if you want to know more about me, that's where you want to go. And stop being stingy and share me with all of your friends. We're on every, every platform. As always, believe that something wonderful is about to happen, but some people miss the message because they're too busy looking for the mess. But not you. Thanks for tuning in. And you've been listening to Sound Bombing. Peace. The Super Bomb questions are brought to you by Mountain Made CBD. Mountain Maid is changing the CBD game by offering a line of high-dose CBD tablets at an affordable price. Their products are THC-free and third-party tested for accuracy, cleanliness, and potency. Their products, which ship nationwide, include Build for CBD saturation, Boost for precision titration, and recover for rest and rehab. With nine years experience in hemp and fitness, Mountain Maid's founders are focused on creating a quality product to help those who live an activated lifestyle. Check out mountainmade.life. Again, that's mountainmade.life to find out more about how their products can help you crush life. Remember, their products ship nationwide. Go check out their website today and follow them on social media at Mountain Made. That's the at symbol M N T M A D E. Our staff at Sound Balming uses Build before our morning workout, which helps to push our bodies to a whole new level on a daily basis. Try Build, try Boost, try Recover. Our staff is using these products to enhance our active lifestyle naturally, and we are crushing life with Mountain Made CBD, and you can too. Start today by going to mountainmade.life and ordering Build, Boost, Recover, or the multitude of other products that they have which will enhance your lifestyle. I promise you, you won't regret it. Thank <laughs> you.